Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is George Salem, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Arab Center Washington. I'm pleased to welcome you to ACW's fifth annual conference and to this panel entitled Voter Demographics and Political Issues in 2020, the Middle East. Thank you for joining us this morning, and thank you to our keynote speaker for providing a wonderful scene setter background for today's discussion. I have the honor of sharing the screen this morning with four exceptional panelists who will examine key constituencies on Middle East issues in the 2020 election. I will introduce them briefly in speaking order. Deborah Shashan is Director of Government Affairs at J Street. She was previously Director of Policy and Government Relations at Americans for Peace Now, an Assistant Professor of Government at the College of William and Mary, and a Research Fellow at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service in Doha. Her expertise and research interests include comparative politics and international relations of the Middle East, U.S. foreign policy, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. After Deborah, we'll hear from Jason Husser, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science and Policy Studies at Elon University. He's also Director of the Elon Poll, which conducts statewide and national surveys on issues of importance to North Carolina voters and residents. His expertise and research interests include American political behavior, public opinion, and survey methodology, and campaigns and elections. Dalia Mahad is Director of Research at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, where she leads research and thought leadership programs for <coughs> American Muslims. She is also the former Executive Director of the Gallup Center for Muslim Studies. In 2009, she was appointed the pres by President Barack Obama to the President's Advisory Council Faith, Faith, and Neighborhood Partnerships, and was invited to testify before the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and the U.S. on the U.S. engagement with Muslim communities. And finally, we will hear from uh, James Zogby, who is co-founder and president of the Arab American Institute, a Washington, D.C.-based organization, which serves as the national political and policy research arm of the Arab American community. He is also the managing director of Zogby Research Services, which specializes in groundbreaking public opinion and polling across the Arab world. Many thanks to all four panelists for joining us today. Before we begin, I would like to you to submit your questions to the panel using the Q&A feature or by email to events at arabcenterdc.org. That's events at arabcenterdc.org. You can also join the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtags, hashtag Arab Center 2020 and Foreign Policy 2020. Um, let us begin uh, with Deborah. <clears throat> Thank you so much. It's great to be with all of you this morning. Um, I want to thank my friend Khalil Jashan uh, for inviting me to um, be on this panel. I, I'm very happy to be here with this uh, very distinguished group. Um, as I get started with my remarks about the Jewish American community in the uh, 2020 election, I do just want to start and um, acknowledge the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, which uh, was, is, of course, a huge loss uh, for all Americans, but uh, I think in particular is a loss for Jewish Americans uh, who you know, found out about her death just as we were entering the Rosh Hashanah holiday, the, the start of the Jewish New Year, um, and just you know, came as a, a huge blow to us as someone who I think um, the Jewish American community really recognizes as um, as the best of our community, and I think in uh, in a lot of ways was representative of some of the things that I'm going to talk about regarding the Jewish American community um, and our universalistic values uh, in terms of the work that she did on behalf of the American people. So, in in talking about uh, Jewish American voters. 
Uh, let me start by, uh, by contextualizing uh, Jewish American voters. Uh, Jews are a very small part of the American population. We are 7.5 million, which makes us only about 2% of the US population. We are, however, super voters, uh, which is to say that Jewish Americans uh, turn out to vote in elections in higher numbers than the rest of the population. So in 2016, in the 2016 presidential election, again, even though we are only 2% of the population, about 4% of votes cast in the election were by Jewish voters. Uh, that was about 5.3 million votes. Now, unfortunately, a lot of our votes are wasted uh, because so many Jewish Americans live in states, especially blue states, which are, which are not swing states, right? Uh, particularly in states like New York and California, over 40% of those votes cast in 2016 were cast in those two states alone, which means uh, that they are essentially wasted. Um, outside of those two of the of our two biggest population centers in the United States, which are New York City and, and Los Angeles, uh, biggest Jewish American population centers are in other places where our votes are not particularly helpful in presidential elections, like in Chicago and Boston. Uh, the the one state I would or one state maybe not the only where our votes really could and uh, make a difference is in Florida. Uh, of course, there is a large concentration of Jewish votes uh, in South Florida. Uh, so that's probably our biggest opportunity to be elect electorally significant in this presidential election, where, of course, uh, Florida is a swing state and uh, likely to be important once again. Now, as for the positioning of Jewish Americans, most Jewish Americans are liberal and uh, are a solid voting bloc for the Democratic Party. The only American population that gives a higher percentage of its vote to the Democratic Party in presidential elections uh, is the African American population. Uh, ideologically, 51% of Jews classify themselves as progressive or liberal. 36% uh, see themselves as moderate. Only 13% of Jewish Americans see themselves as politically conservative. Regarding the Jewish vote in 2016, 71% of Jews voted for Hillary Clinton, 24% voted for Donald Trump. And I think it's worth noting that in the subsequent midterm election in 2018, even a higher percent of Jews voted for Democratic candidates. Uh, it went up to 76% voted for Democrats only 19% voted for Republicans. And I think we can probably attribute some of that to a reaction to uh, the first two years of Donald Trump's presidency. So how do Jewish Americans feel about Donald Trump? Obviously very relevant question as far as the 2020 uh, election goes, which of course is you know, second term presidential elections uh, are typically a referendum on the sitting president. Well. Three quarters of Jewish Americans have unfavorable views of Donald Trump. Uh, that's 75% have unfavorable views, 24% have favorable views, um, and most Jewish Americans uh, intensely dislike Donald Trump. So of that 75% who have unfavorable views, 66% have very unfavorable views of the sitting president. Uh, when Jews are asked in a poll, uh, in an open-ended fashion, what matters most to them in the 2020 election, the top response is, in fact, defeating Donald Trump. So what are Jewish Americans' top tier priorities in the 2020 election? I'll, I'll list uh, the top priorities off for you. Uh, you have protecting Social Security and Medicare, lowering healthcare costs, uh, new gun safety laws, fighting anti-Semitism, uh, fighting white nationalist violence and terrorism, climate change, and fighting racism. Um, 
On the issue of anti-Semitism, which uh, figures into the top issues, as I mentioned, of Jewish Americans, 67% uh, of Jewish voters see anti-Semitism as both a major and also a growing problem in the United States. And in that regard, it's certainly significant that many Americans see Donald Trump as a purveyor of anti-Semitism. Uh, among Jewish voters, 76% believe that Donald Trump holds racist views and 58%, a solid majority, believe that Donald Trump holds anti-Semitic views. Uh, asked on the at the time of the 2018 midterm election, uh, the question of responsibility for the shootings in the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh, a full 72% of Jewish Americans held Donald Trump at least somewhat responsible uh, for that shooting in the Pittsburgh synagogue. Interestingly, although Donald Trump and those around him like to tout uh, the fact that Donald Trump has a Jewish daughter and son-in-law, uh, Jewish Americans are not particularly impressed by this. 64% of Jewish Americans have unfavorable views of Jared Kushner. Only 22% have favorable views of him. Uh, and these unfavorable views extend to other prominent uh, Jewish individuals in the Trump administration, uh, like Stephen Miller. Uh, only 7% of Jewish Americans have a favorable view of him. So uh, this brings us to the question of the Middle East, uh, and specifically Israel and Jewish views as pertain to the 2020 election. I think we should start with this, right? That the issue of Israel is a low priority for most Jewish Americans. You noted, uh, hopefully, that as I listed off top priorities for Jewish Americans, Israel did not figure into the list. Only uh, 24, less than 24% of Jewish Americans rank the U.S.-Israel relationship as a top priority in this election. And most Jewish Americans are more progressive on the question of Israel and Israel-Palestine and the U.S.-Israel relationship than many believe. Uh, and at, and then is the case for many uh, Jewish American establishment organizations in terms of their positioning. So 60 5% of Jewish Americans do feel at least somewhat attached to Israel. 32% uh, feel very attached. Uh, in uh, a poll taken on in November of 2018, 78% uh, supported a two-state peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. Um, so, which is to say, I suppose, that uh, Jewish Americans have a different perspective on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, not only than uh, the, the positioning that some Jewish establishment organizations take, but also than the sitting uh, Israeli government, which no longer supports a two-state solution. In terms of other key uh, Middle East issues among the Jewish American community, there is strong support for the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, in 2018, 71% reported that they supported the agreement and 67% disapprove of President Donald Trump's decision to pull out of the agreement. It's also worth noting, I think, among those who do prioritize the issue of Israel, uh, that Vice President Biden, who, uh, of course, is the Democratic nominee, also has, uh, I think you could say, strong pro-Israel credentials, although some would try to discredit him. Uh, it's worth remembering that uh, the Obama-Biden administration agreed to a 10-year memorandum of understanding uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu that provided for uh, the largest amount of, of, uh, of aid to Israel, military aid to Israel that the United States has ever given. So just to end with, uh, with bottom line, uh, where are Jewish Americans right now? Uh, the latest poll that I've seen, which was released about a, a week ago, um, uh, said that 67% of Jews plan to vote for Biden, 30% plan to vote for Trump. 
Um, frankly, those numbers in this in this one poll are surprising to me. I would be surprised um, if 30 percent actually um, do turn out and vote for Trump. Uh, Donald Trump, you know, in my view, is offensive to Jewish values and to Jewish Americans. Uh, this is a president, of course, who after Charlottesville uh, said that there were very fine people on both sides. Uh, someone who has repeatedly trafficked in anti-Semitic tropes, uh, like uh, the one of dual loyalty uh, in terms of the, the thought that uh, Jews are loyal to Israel. Um, at a pre-Rosh Hashanah conference call with select Jewish leaders just last week, uh, President Trump said, we really appreciate you. We love your country. Of course, he was there talking about Israel and thank you very much. Uh, and this is also someone that has said that he thinks that any Jewish people that vote for a Democrat, uh, and of course, as you've seen, the vast majority of Jews don't, do vote for Democrats. Uh, in his words, it shows either a total lack of knowledge or great disloyalty. Uh, remember in terms of uh, the uh, Israel and Israel-Palestine policies that Donald Trump uh, has enacted, which of course, uh, which I'm sure some think might endear him to the Jewish American community. Just remember that Trump stated uh, merely weeks ago that moving the, in his words, moving the Israeli capital to Jerusalem, of course he meant uh, moving the US embassy, but what does he know, was quote unquote, for the evangelicals. Uh, so in my mind, uh, one of the uh, most important talks that's gonna happen on this panel is actually the, the discussion about evangelical Americans who of course are a most, uh, much more significant share of the US population and really uh, the target of Trump's Israel, Palestine uh, and Middle East policy. So with that, uh, I'll leave it there. And I wanna just apologize that I can't stay for the full panel. Uh, but uh, but I'm happy, happy to stay with you as long as I can. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, Deborah, and, and you just give it an excellent segue to our next speaker, uh, Jason Husser, uh, who will address the evangelical vote in his remarks. Thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about evangelicals and happy to, to say more in the Q&A period that follows. Um, so when we're talking about evangelicals, it's important to start out discussing what do we mean by that. Pollsters like myself use a lot of different definitions of evangelicals, and there's several ways we can try to identify who are evangelicals in surveys. And one simple way is just to ask people if they self-identify as an evangelical or born-again Christian. A more sophisticated and really better approach um, is to, to ask people their specific denomination once they identify that they're Protestant, and then try to code each of those individuals into one of the groups. Most polls don't do that because it's very time intensive, both um, at the back end of a survey and going into the survey, it takes a lot of questionnaire space that we could use for other more substantive sort of issue questions. And so um, when I'm talking about evangelicals here, I'm sort of mixing those approaches. Some polls do, do the approach where people self-identify. Other times, pollsters are categorizing them based on their response. Another important thing to note before I go into some numbers is I'm largely talking about white evangelical Protestants. Um, even though there are Protestant groups that uh, that in many ways may align religiously with white evangelical Protestants, the definition we're talking about is largely um, about white Americans in churches that have traditionally been fairly politically conservative. The, the landscape of evangelical Protestants is fairly complex. Um, there are hundreds of different Protestant denominations, hundreds of different evangelical denominations. It's very confusing even, um, I remember writing a dissertation related to evangelicals and voting and thinking, I can't remember all of these different Baptist groups, which one of these is a mainline Protestant, which one is an evangelical Protestant. Um, Pew Research has a good table um, if anybody's interested in details trying to classify the various groups. Um, so let's just go through some basic numbers. In terms of scope, about one in four American adults belong to an evangelical Christian denomination. This makes evangelicals the most common religious group, um, just ahead of those without a religious affiliation. Uh, in terms of change over time, evangelicals are not necessarily growing that much, and particularly some of the more formal denominations like Southern Baptist, the big one. Uh, the nuns are the fastest growing religious group in the United States, those unaffiliated. Uh, 
the percentage of evangelicals, it was down um, from a measure I looked at in 2014 from 2007, and it's probably down a little bit now in 2020 from uh, 2014. So what about what do we find in other places? So the national election poll, these are the exit polls, found 26% of 2016 voters self-identified as white evangelical Christians. Beyond their total numbers, 64% um, of evangelicals reported church attendance at least weekly compared to 35% of other Christians. So they tend to go to church more, at least they say they do, suggesting potential for higher frequency of politically relevant messaging. This messaging could happen in the churches, but it can also happen in social communities connected to the churches. Um, since the Lyndon Johnson the administration, a lot of churches do have IRS restrictions about advocating for certain candidates. And so this messaging may not take place from the pulpit itself. It may just take part because people are um, embedded in this social community where they're, they're hearing messages that resonate with one party or another. Um, Preachers also have the ability to push a vote a certain way without saying, I hope you'll go vote for President Trump today, but talking about issues that align with that person. So oftentimes the messaging in churches may not be overtly political um, in terms of picking a candidate, but these evangelicals tend to be in church more often, and so they're getting a lot of messages um, connecting religion and politics. So who are the evangelicals? Let's go into this a little bit more. Um, they are demographically distinct on several politically relevant dimensions. Um, in many ways, evangelicals are set up to be Republicans, even if there weren't a religious connection. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, among registered voters in the census region south, 21% identifies white evangelicals. So you have a, a census region that tends to vote for Republicans more often. Evangelicals tend to, to be clustered more in the south than other regions. Um, however, 13% of voters in the West identify as evangelicals, 14% in the Midwest, and um, only 8% in the Northeast. White evangelicals are less likely to report incomes over $150,000. They're less likely to um, have bachelor's or higher education levels. And importantly, I think for the future of the Republican coalition, evangelicals tended to be older. Among registered voters in one um, Associated Press survey, uh, 8% were white evangelicals if they were under 40. Among those over 40, 19% were white evangelicals. So um, the evangelical coalition, while still a large part of the electorate in the next 10 or 20 years is, is one that could potentially decline over time. Um, this is consistent with a lot of other demographic declines that don't point um, to necessarily the most rosy numbers for Republicans in decades ahead. So what about voting? Uh, since really 1980 and Reagan's first election, evangelicals have been a key component of the Republican Electoral Coalition. Jimmy Carter in 76 enjoyed fairly high support among evangelicals, probably key to his victory there. But the rise of, sort of the moral majority and Jerry Falwell um, led most evangelicals to become reliable Republican voters over time. Um, in 2016, the national election pool exit survey had Donald Trump leading Hillary Clinton among white evangelicals by 79% to 16%. So Trump was winning evangelicals by over 60 points. White evangelicals composed 46% of Trump's coalition in exit polling compared to only 9% um, of Clinton's coalition. So roughly four out of 10 or so Trump voters are evangelicals. This is in part why it's um, an important group for him to make sure they're motivated to turn out to vote. A 2018 AP survey found white evangelicals were twice as likely to approve of Do Donald Trump's job performance um, as other voters. So even though Trump's made a number of personal sort of life behavioral decisions that don't align with evangelicals, they're still supporting him both in the election and then after the election. There's not that much reason to think that 2020 is going to be that different in that regard. Going through a few other things, um, there are a small percentage of white evangelical Protestants who consistently vote for Democrats or they identify as liberals. It's not enough necessarily to change the course of a national election. However, um, liberal evangelicals tend to be clustered in certain churches and in certain communities. And so at a local context, the evangelical left does have political power. 
but we just don't see it that much at a, a national scale when we're talking about horse races for the presidential election. But they certainly can be influential for like a state representative race um, or a mayoral race, things that may be largely clustered in that one community. So going on to um, issues, evangelicals in many ways look like Republicans on the issues, even if you control for um, their religious affiliation. So I conducted a poll back in February of North Carolina voters and asked them a series of issue proximity questions. I think I had about 15 issues in there. And then I asked uh, voters in North Carolina, which part are you closer on? So um, I ran an analysis on six different issues, controlling for um, a, a number of factors related to demographics, trying to figure out how big is this evangelical effect? So if you just take all voters overall, it looks like being an evangelical matters a lot. This religious identity is really driving their views. So, for instance, on health care, when you control for um, most demographic factors other than party affiliation, 58 percent of evangelicals favor the Republican Party over the Democratic Party on health care, uh, as opposed to 33 percent of non-evangelicals. We find similar gaps on the other issues that I made this comparison on the economy, immigration, abortion, gun control, the environment. But when you control for party and you limit uh, the analysis just to Republicans, you don't really see very significant, statistically significant differences between evangelicals and non-evangelicals. So among Republican evangelicals, we'll use health care again for consistency, 80 percent favored the Republican Party on the issue. Among Republican non-evangelicals, 73 percent favored the Republican Party. So this is controlling for, um, for gender and race and education level and income. That's not a, a big difference. And so in many ways, being an evangelical moves the needle up towards Republicans or towards the Republican Party a little bit among Republicans, but it's not a huge impact. Where we see the bigger impact, though, is being an evangelical moves unaffiliated voters and Democrats closer to the Republican Party on a number of issues. Um, so, for instance, among unaffiliated voters in North Carolina, the largest unaffiliated voters in, in North Carolina, where I'm based, are the largest um, group in the state, the largest voter registration group. On abortion, an evangelical uh, unaffiliated voter has a 60 percent chance of favoring the Republican Party. An unaffiliated non-evangelical has a 36 percent chance. Uh, we see a similar, uh, though not quite as, as large of an effect size on gun control. When it comes to the economy, that effect size is even smaller. So there's only nine points sort of bonus towards the Republicans for being an evangelical among unaffiliated. So being an evangelical matters, but in many ways, these are voters who would be voting for Republicans um, one way or another. What's important to note, though, is evangelicals aren't just to, close to Trump. They're close to the entire party on a wide array of issues. This is true not only on issues that are con connected to religion, but also those that not, aren't necessarily those that come to mind as um, religiously based. The uh, Baylor University conducted a survey I want to highlight as I start to wrap up here. This was in 2017, and so they have some nice summary findings. Evangelicals um, tend to consider themselves very religious. They tend to think of the United States as a Christian nation, so the identity of the nation is Christian. They tend to believe that God is actively engaged in world affairs. They're far more likely to uh, overtly say they fear Muslims and refugees from the Middle East, and they're more likely to have traditional views of gender roles and LGBT rights. I wanted to add a couple points um, related to the prior panelists related to support of Israel and sort of why that might be. Um, there's actually not a lot of polling done on why evangelicals have the foreign policy preferences they have, especially related to um, U.S.-Israeli relations. There are some snippets and insights that that I think are, are worth noting, and, and maybe Jim's going to talk more about this as well. I point out a couple things, um, surveys that are I think are helpful. So Baylor University also conducted a survey back in 2005 that asked about belief in certain aspects of the Bible and how is that prevalent in, in evangelical versus non-white evangelical communities. So belief in the rapture, for instance, 67% um, of white evangelicals absolutely believed in the rapture, compared to only 23% of non-white evangelicals in the U.S. Armageddon had a similar uh, distinction. 60% uh, 
of white evangelicals absolutely believed in Armageddon compared to 24 percent of non-evangelicals. That was in 2005. It may have changed a little bit since 2005 to 2020. Um, the Southern Baptist Association um, connected to LifeWay also conducts some specialized evangelical surveys. And so they found um, a few interesting things. And I don't, I don't know that much about the survey, so I don't want to emphasize it too much. But a lot of them um, agreed that God's promise to Abraham and his descendants were for all time. So 80 percent of evangelicals in the survey agreed with that. 76 agreed that Christians should support the Jewish people's right to live in the sovereign state of Israel. 69 percent agreed that the Jewish people have a historical right to the land of Israel. So from this, the, on the issue of U.S.-Israeli elections or relations among white evangelicals, views of the Bible are, are definitely key. I earlier presented some numbers to suggest that uh, in a lot of ways, evangelicals vote Republican because they're like Republicans in almost every other way, and the religious dimension may not be pushing them forward. But on particular issues, um, abortion being one and U.S.-Israeli relations, there is a very clear evidence that these are religious beliefs driving their politics, not in many ways their religion and politics aligning because everything else aligns. I think that's all the comments I have. Look forward to the next panelist. Thank, thank you very much, Jason. Very uh, interesting. We'll uh, get to some questions we have of you in the Q&A. Deborah, uh, how much longer do we have you? Because I did get a question from the audience I want to raise. Are you, will you Great. be here to the end? or? Do you I cannot stay to the end. I, I I have to be off at 11. I, I can stay until just before then. Well, let me go ahead and ask the question now before we Please. move to Dalia. Um, uh, the uh, questioner asks um, whether uh, everyone heard very clearly your point, by the way, about uh, the role of Israel in the <laughs> Jewish mindset um, when it comes to voting. Uh, and it's relatively small. Um, are the highly publicized efforts by the Adelsons and other big Jewish donors in support of the Trump campaign uh, going to have any impact on uh, the Jewish vote in November? What is your opinion? Great. Thanks. Thank you for that question. Um, so what I would say is it is absolutely true. Uh, your questioner raises a fair point that uh, there are there are absolutely some Jewish Americans. Uh, Sheldon Adelson uh, is, is certainly one of them who supports Trump. And of course, Sheldon Adelson is uh, a uh, billionaire and extremely wealthy individual uh, and uh, one of the largest donors to the Trump campaign. Um, and so, uh, you know, that that certainly uh makes presumably some sort of difference he's also uh a supporter of some organizations uh that uh co that you know play a, a role within the jewish community one that i would point to would be the republican jewish coalition he's a, a very generous uh donor of that organization whose aim uh is to try to get a larger percentage of jewish americans uh, to vote Republican, there is no indication uh, that they are succeeding or making much progress on that front. Um, on the other side, of course, you know you have uh, you have wealthy individuals uh, and non-wealthy individuals within the the Jewish American community uh, that invest their resources in support of the Democratic Party. So, um, uh, and of course, you know some of those are. Uh, the same individuals that the the Trump administration uh, uh, tries to to claim are responsible uh, for the success of the Democratic Party. I mean, if you think of some of the advertising that the Trump campaign put out right before the 2016 election, which some uh, uh, um, accused of at least some uh, tinges of dog whistling anti-Semitism of claiming that individuals like George Soros. Uh, were responsible for uh, funding uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign um, uh, and for for any success that she might have, and you know, vilifying them to try to bring up voters on the other side. Uh, you know, uh, you know, you have Sheldon Adelson, and and he plays a certain role, but uh, you know, I wouldn't overplay it 
when you think of the landscape of the Jewish American community in which uh, Sheldon Adelson is, is certainly an outlier, uh, but one who, uh, who uses uh, his wallet in significant ways. It's, it's certainly true. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daria. Okay, Turn great. Thank you. Turning now uh, to Dalia Magahed, uh, who will, uh, in her remarks, just the Muslim uh, vote. Please, Dalia. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, special thanks to Lena for inviting me and to all the organizers of this conference. Um, I am the director of research at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Just to give you a brief background on our organization, we do research and education to help inform dialogue and decision making on the American Muslim community. So that is our, um, our, our focus. And we've done polling now for the past five years. Our 2020 poll will be released on October 1st. So please mark your calendars. Uh, but since then, since 2016, we've been doing um, an annual poll of not only American Muslims, but American Muslims, American Jews, and then the general public that we break out into Catholics, Protestants, and then within the Protestant community, white evangelicals, and then of course the non-affiliated. So what's really special about these reports is it's the only source really that looks at the American faith landscape. Uh, all consistently across the board. And so what I'll be sharing is some comparisons of Muslim Americans to other faith communities, but mostly focusing on, on American Muslims. So just to set uh, the foundation, some basic demographics of American Muslims. The first thing that makes American Muslims very unique is that they are the most ethnically and racially diverse faith community in America. They're the only faith community with no majority race. And so when you look at the breakdown of uh, American Muslims, the plurality identify as Black or African American, uh, and that uh, is usually around uh, between 25 and 33 percent of American Muslims identify as Black. 23% um, is Asian, and that would be South Asian, Pakistan, uh, India, um, and, and other Asians. Uh, only 14% identified as Arab in 2019, and then 19% as white. 8% um, is Hispanic. That's by far the fastest growing group within the American Muslim community. And then the rest are uh, mixed race or other races. So 1% have consistently identified as Native American. Um, now, before I, I go any further, I'll just mention the point about white Muslims because it, it's always a question I get at the end. So I'll just answer it now. The 19% is white and people are always like, what are you talking about? What do you, who are these white Muslims? Well, white Muslims, people who identify as white are, um, are from backgrounds like Turkey or, or Persia in, or Iran, um, Bosnia, Chechnya, uh, and other places that are, you know, where white people are from. And they are also Muslim. And there's also some white converts in that group. So it's not entirely unlikely that this would be the case. Um, I also want to emphasize that this is a number that is very robust. It's what Pew finds, it's what Gallup found, it's what ISP has found five years in a row. So it's not like a fluke. It really is 19% or so. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is we do offer Arab as an actual identity for race. So these aren't all Arabs who, th you know, who, who are just having to choose white, they um, they do have a choice of also being Arab. So they there are possibly some Arabs in there who are choosing white over Arab. So I just want to make that clear, but this is all self-identified. Half of American Muslims were born in the United States and half were born outside the United States. So whereas um, it's we're not all immigrants, but the immigrant story is still a very important part of the American Muslim story. However, 86% total are citizens of the United States. Now, when you look at other kinds of demographics, Muslim Americans are by far the youngest, not meaning um, 
you know, recent immigrants, but youth in terms of the average age. The average age of American Muslims is 20 years, a full 20 years younger than the general public. So a very young um, community. And 35% of American Muslims are poor, are living at or below the poverty line. And this is not usually the story you get. Uh, the model minority is the one that I think a lot of people want to project. But American Muslims are actually the most likely faith community to um, <clears throat> to have a portion of their community that is poor. It's the largest percentage of any faith community. So whereas there are many rich Muslims, there are also a lot of poor Muslims. And it's when you look at faith communities, it's the most um, economically diverse as well, not only the most racially diverse. 73% in 2019 were registered to vote of the citizens. So this is very important. It's not 73% of the total, but of those eligible to vote. And this is, this is according to polls. And as you all know, um, polls always tap into populations that are more likely to vote than the you know, actual general public. So we're only looking at comparisons here. And, and so this 73% who, who are registered to vote are less likely than every other faith community. So American Muslims still lag behind other faith communities in their registration, even, and this is all among eligible voters. Um, now, what about party affiliation? Interestingly, uh, American Muslims are much more likely to be Democrats than Republicans, but they are the most likely faith community to identify as independent. Now, in 2018, though, they were the most likely, even surpassing Jewish Americans, they most likely to uh, vote Democrat. So 76% said they voted for a Democrat in the 2018 midterm election. Now, there are also Muslim Republicans. They are a small minority. They're the least likely faith community to identify as Republican. Uh, and in 2016, only 4% favored uh, Trump as the next president. Now, um, those who identify as Republican are about 15%, which is, you know, I think many people will say is a huge switch versus the 90s where I think American Muslims were thought of as Republican. That is, uh, I don't have any good polls. I don't know of any polls of American Muslims during the 90s, but what we do know now is that is no longer the case. Uh, American Muslims are much more likely now to vote Democratic than they once were. Now, what about identity? Uh, there, there's a lot of conversation, especially among Republicans and especially during Republican primaries that are really using recycling anti-Semitic tropes and applying them to Muslims when it comes to dual loyalty and identity. And uh, people coming out just very openly and saying, you know, you can't be both Muslim and American or a devout Muslim can't follow the constitution. And we have to do these religious tests to make to see if uh, candidates are um, prefer the constitution or Sharia and things like that. And so what we found is that Muslims are as likely as every other American faith group that we poll to identify strongly with their country, with, with being an American. They also identify very strong, strongly with being Muslim. And we've, you know, we asked these two identity questions separately. We didn't force a choice because we wanted to see how they relate to each other. And what we found very interestingly is that a strong faith community, a strong faith identity was associated with an even stronger American identity than Muslims with a weak faith identity. So the two identities are not in, in competition, but rather uh, mutually reinforcing. Now, what are American Muslims um, economic or, or rather um, political priorities for the next uh, administration. The most important issues that um, concern American Muslims are the economy, job creation, civil liberties, and um, civil rights. They're the, you know, just as an aside, the most likely faith community to say they support the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so the two most important issues facing American Muslims are about 
you know, basic kind of kitchen table issues around the economy and jobs, and then fighting Islamophobia and racism. Um, after those two, which are the two top, you have uh, education, um, healthcare, and fighting um, domestic poverty. Now, why we've looked at this issue of why American Muslim um, voter registration lags behind um, other faith communities. And we found a couple of things. So first, in 2016, the number, the percentage of people who were uh, registered to vote who were eligible was only 60%. So the first thing to know is it's actually, over the past four years, has climbed steadily, and very um, relatively quickly. But so that's, that's sort of good news for those who are, um, who want American Muslims to participate. But the other thing we found is that in, in 2016, 85% of American Muslims said they intend to vote, but only 60% were registered to vote. And so that 25% who wanted to vote but weren't registered, we sort of jokingly called them the inshallah voter. Um, now that that gap between intention to vote and registration has closed over time, thank God, right? But there's still a solid 15% of eligible voters who don't even intend to vote, who not only they're not registered, but they don't even wanna vote. They're saying we're not going to vote. And so we looked at that group. What is driving this refusal to vote or you know a disinterest in voting and um whereas several people would have said especially 15 20 years ago you know there's some religious um you know belief that you can't vote or something like that that was not what we found in this 15 percent now in in this uh you know 2019 2018. the 15 percent who did not intend on voting their reasons for not wanting to vote were the dissatisfaction with the choices or the belief that their vote didn't matter. Uh, so a the, the kind of answers that you would hear from other, really other minority groups who just aren't believing in the system or that their voice counts. Now, what we, we also wanted to look at what makes someone more likely to vote? And so we looked at um, people who took part in the 2018 midterm election. And so if you vote in a midterm, you know, you're probably more motivated even than if you vote for, uh, you know, in a presidential um, election. We wanted to study what, what predicts higher voter participation in the Muslim community. And, and really there were four things, and this is uh, controlling for other demographics. Um, the first and most, the, the strongest predictor of participating in the midterm election was that that person had contacted a local elected official in the last year. So local politics and the participation in local politics is very, very important. The other things are um, having a higher income, which is not very surprising, being older, so being older than 50 years old. And again, as you might remember I said Muslims were on average much younger than the general population. And then interestingly, attending a religious service weekly. So this is not unique to Muslims. Uh, this is a, uh, a factor that we find across the board for really all faith communities. If you are attending a faith, uh, a religious service weekly, you are more likely to participate politically. So I'll just end with, um, four data-driven ways to increase voter participation. The first is, or, or, or political impact of, of American Muslims, who, by the way, only make up about 1% of the population. First is to build from the ground up, to really focus on local elections where Muslims can actually make uh, a difference. So Muslims in, in America tend to um, live in swing states. So they actually can make a difference even in the national election, but even more so on local elections. The other thing about um, building from the ground up is that local elections can cure people a little bit more believing that their vote doesn't count and that nothing makes a difference because in local elections, they absolutely do make a difference. The second is to mobilize at mosques. 
for voter registration drives. And you see, you see that more and more. Although not all Muslims uh, attend a mosque weekly, um, the, a slight majority do say they do, uh, around 60%. And this is a number that's been consistent year after year. 60% of Muslims say they attend a mosque weekly um, for, religious, uh, for, for religious service. Uh, and it's also linked with higher voter registration. So it's, it's, a, it's a place where people are, are gathering, at least when we don't have a pandemic. Uh, the, th the third is to build coalitions with allies. Now, first, with 1% of the population, you're not going to be able to make a difference without building coalitions and without finding allies. And um, when you look at Muslim American political priorities, they are shared with many other groups. And then fourth, and, and I think this would really make the biggest difference, is to focus on economically disadvantaged and young Muslims, because both of those groups are both a, uh, a large percentage of the American Muslim community, and they are the least likely to be registered to vote. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Dalia. Uh, Jim. Uh, listen, um, I am um, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, uh, Jason, I just want to comment that uh, there was an expression you used that I will continue to mull over, referring to Trump making life behavioral decisions. I found that a delightful euphemism for some really deplorable behaviors, but that's uh, uh, that's that's interesting, and I'll. I'll, I'll I'll stay with that. Um, I, I must say that I, in in preparing my remarks, I actually got stuck on the first um, the first part. That is to say, the uh, the first set of questions about the election uh, in general. What, what are the expectations? What are polls tell us about priorities? Will the progressive wing, et cetera, et cetera? And I, I'd like to start there, and then maybe get into Arab Americans um, uh, toward the toward the end, if you don't mind. I wrote a piece uh, last week called The Armageddon Election, and I think that um, not in the, the, the terms of used by evangelicals, but, but in terms of end of the world, I think both sides clearly see it as that, and I think have reason to. Um, it is, um, um, is going to be a, a decisive election in so many ways, and certainly the, the passing of, of Ruth Gader, Bader Ginsburg um, uh, brings that home um, in in a in a very powerful way for for both sides, um, a poll I saw. I mean, uh, our our first speaker Kyle referred to um, eighty three percent of the electorate seeing this as a uh, as a, a critical election. More interesting to me was another set of numbers that said that forty percent of Republicans, if Joe Biden won would attribute his victory to, to voter fraud. 67% of Democrats said that if Donald Trump wins, uh, that would probably be voter suppression and other dirty tricks played. Um, so there's a sense that um, it's not just voters see this as, uh, as I, I guess, uh, I, what do you call it, uh, uh, Donald Trump Jr. Uh, referred to it as a choice between work, school, and church versus rioting, looting, and vandalism. I mean, it was that kind of uh, of, of end of days language. Um, it is, as Donald Trump was suggesting in in, in Minnesota uh, just uh, the other day, um, it was about white America. It was about saving us from refugees, saving us from our, our foreignness. Um, and for Democrats, it's a, a vision of how do you salvage. Um, the some decency, some sense of of, of moving forward uh, toward a, a a better country that includes all citizens, race, color, and creed. I, I think it's it's um, it's that kind of intensity that is making this election so important. And while I once thought that I worried more about what would happen after the election um, in terms of the potential for violence, uh, which I think is very real. Uh, I am now as concerned about what happens before the election. Uh, seeing pictures in Virginia this weekend when they just began early voting, uh, 
with uh, Trump people blocking entrances uh, for people to not be able to get in, uh, says to me that we're, in, we're, we're here at a point where the stakes are so high in terms of people's sense of what is going on here, that this is, 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 is a, a, a very real possibility that violence uh, erupts. Uh, the intensity is real. Um, the enthusiasm is a different factor. And I think with all the communities that we're talking about, the question of, of intensity is going to make the, the ultimate difference. It's clear that in national polls, Biden is up. Um, it's, it's also clear that in terms of support among Democrats and Republicans on each side, um, they're both about even. Um, but underneath that uh, is the fact that Joe Biden has strong support among 46 percent of his supporters and only moderate support among 43 percent whereas Trump has 66% strong support and 23% uh, moderate support. And 56% of Biden voters, I think uh, uh, Kyle mentioned this in the beginning, say they're voting for him because he's not Trump. Um, now, will the intensity uh, change as a result of Ruth Bader Ginsburg? That may be one issue. Uh, Democrats, some Democrats have been trying to bring home the fact that the Supreme Court matters, that justices matter. Um, that is something that this may bring home to Democrats, whether they win or lose this fight um, in, in going forward before election, uh, before the, 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 the inauguration. Nevertheless, I think intensity is now going to be a, um, uh, a bigger issue for Democrats, even if the we're voting for him because he's not Donald Trump goes up. It will be an, a more intense, I think, support for for getting rid of of Trump, and then the issue of 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 the pandemic, I think, is another factor here that we can't ignore. Has played a, a huge role. Uh, the conventions weren't conventions; they were virtual infomercials, um, very long infomercials. They portrayed a picture of what America, the America they wanted. There was the inclusive one versus the, I guess the. Kimberly Guilfoyle one. I mean, I was kind of trying to sort out what the what the visions were. But there was a wonderful article by um, Finten O'Toole, who's uh, just a brilliant writer. New York Review of Books carries his stuff, and he he referred to the the Democratic one as the, the messaging that he used was, I thought, quite uh, quite wonderful. He he said it was an existential choice between good and evil, light and darkness, between ending the racial divide, bringing about justice, celebrating diversity, and creating a sense of common purpose, or on the Republican side, exacerbating social tension, division, and sinking deeper into the muck of hatred, anger, and chaos. I mean, that's how Democrats view the choice. And after Ruth Gader, Bader Ginsburg, I think that, that that is even, like I said, going to be uh, more, in, more intense. Um, issues. Um, what are the issues here? Um, the issues are Donald Trump's performance in office. It plays both ways. I mean, it, I, I find, you know, it, I, I used to use uh, the emperor's new clothes to talk about about Donald Trump. I mean, there are people who still think he's got clothes on um, and he's he's buck naked. Um, he uh, um, the issue of why people continue to believe when they know or they ought to know it's not true because the, the truth is self-evident, is really, I think, very troubling. And it's something that we're going to take to take a long time to, to sort out. Um, it went from his hands are actually large and the crowds are bigger and he won a bigger victory than even Ronald Reagan did. Um, and when confronted with the reality that it wasn't there, it becomes fake news or as... as um, uh, his spokesperson said back in in uh, in in 2017 uh, after the inauguration, it was alternate fact. Um, this is stuck with us, and we we so it's it's not just we have two electorates. Um, we have, and, and I I argue that when you look at the polling, it's not just partisan. It's actually demographic. We have two different countries looking at each other, with white, um, largely white largely um, uh, more rural, more or less educated, uh, more male, uh, more evangelical, 41% of Republican voters say that they're born again, uh, versus uh, younger, professional educated women, 
black, Latina, uh, and, uh, uh, and Asian voters. And, and these two distinct demographics see the world in completely different ways. They, 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 they can't even agree on what they're seeing. Um, and that, I think, is a huge issue. The, the America that each side is seeing is completely different than the other one. Um, and, and I struggle with trying to understand that. Um, um, why, on the evangelical side, um, why they can look at Donald Trump with his, as you said, um, his questionable decisions, uh, behavioral decisions, um, and still see him as the moral force. Uh, there's something else driving that that I think we need to to better un understand. And so um, this election is going to be about that. It's going to be about their their uh, some voters um, drawn to this uh, the certainty that he gives them, even if the certainty is about questionable facts. Um, the sense that he's saving their country, which means saving them from foreigners from uh, from rioting and looting and and behaviors that they you know are, are not as apparent but nevertheless he's made them real uh, for them these are going to be issues that are going to be played out uh, among the electorate how intense he is able to create the sense among his voters that um, that all is lost if he loses that uh, that they uh, the the America that he wants them to live in and that they want to live in because they find themselves uprooted and threatened and challenged and and uh, um, and socially dislocated from the values that they grew up with um, how intense they're going to feel that is going to what's what's going to drive them and on the other side what's going to drive uh, the vote is um, how intensely they feel that that their vision of America is is at risk. Uh, that what they want for their children and for their future uh, and for the country they live in uh, to be uh, protected and saved. Uh, uh, other issues are going to be, uh, are there, but they're they're actually secondary. It, this is going to be a gut election. Uh, and sure, um, performance on, on, uh, on, on how he, he in, whether he delivered the goods is, is something, whether... Um, uh, he's made America safer and greater in the world and all of that. But at the end of the day, uh, because those performance issues are all up for question. I mean, I think he did nothing. His supporters think he did everything. That it's it, Because the, the two views are so wildly different, it's the gut issue that's going to matter. And that's, I think, what we need to, to sort through. Now, just a word about Arab Americans. Um, we're about 3.7 uh, million. Uh, we are uh, largely in uh, in states that matter. Um, Michigan, for example, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, also Florida. Uh, big numbers in California, but as you know, that state doesn't much matter uh, in terms of electoral, in terms of decision. I mean, it's gonna be democratic, we know that, and so we're not gonna make a difference, but we will make a difference in Michigan Ohio and Pennsylvania. And what I'm thrilled about is that attention is being paid to the community. Now, how does the community vote? Um, we saw in terms of voter ID, uh, the split was about what the rest of the country was all the way through the 90s. Slightly leaning Democratic with about a third, 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 with a excess of Democrats, maybe three, four percent, and then the independent uh, picking up the remainder. Um, around the time of uh, 2002, that began to switch. Um, and it began to switch increasingly every year. The gap began to open so that by the last time we polled, which was 16, we're polling again uh, in the next week or so, um, the gap was almost two-thirds, one-third Democrat, Republican in terms of voter ID. Um, and in terms of voter performance, the same thing. Now, the, the community is um, about two-thirds Christian, one-third Muslim, um, and a little little more, actually, because more recent immigrants, while still Christian, are, are also Muslim, and, and less uh, from Lebanon, Syria, and more from North Africa and uh, Iraq, Egypt, et cetera. Um, the, the numbers and Somalia, which has become a huge um, um, source of, of new immigrants, since uh, since 2000. 
Uh, in any case, uh, the, the, the differences that we find in terms of party ID are those born here, uh, especially in their second generation, uh, tend to be a little more Republican, but still they lean Democrat. Um, those born overseas and registered to vote overwhelmingly vote uh, and, and identify as Democrat. Um, the issues that are important to them are, uh, while there are differences clearly in terms of um, country of origin, born here, born there, et cetera, um, the issues are the issues that are important for everybody in America. It's, it's the economy, it's healthcare, it's education. Um, Palestine ranks high as a concern. Lebanon is a concern. Human rights in the Arab world is a concern. Uh, when we talk about the Middle East, they, they matter. But in the end of the day, they're going to vote on the issues like every other voter th that are the gut issues of the kind of world they want their kids to grow up in, whether or not they feel threatened and afraid uh, by, by the outcome of one versus the other. And while I, there are some um, activists who will argue for a pro-Assad view or a pro-opposition view or a pro-this view or a pro-that view, a at the end of the day, most Arab American voters, um, you know, I, I say, you know, the, the, the bomb in Baghdad will hurt their family, but the, you know, the, the education their kid gets is what's ultimately going to matter to them. They're going to vote for how they feel about their future here uh, in America. And those are the issues that matter to them. They want to be respected. They don't want to be discriminated against. They have reacted. And I think what happened to move the needle toward uh, more support for Democrats was the, the racial taunting, the insulting rhetoric coming from Republicans and the policies of the Bush administration, which while they affected recent immigrants, um, affected the community as a whole. There was a trauma about this targeting, profiling, discrimination against Arabs and Muslims. Um, and that has lasted till now. And frankly, the, the Republican Party under Donald Trump hasn't done a whole lot to convince people uh, that they were any different than that. So, what, you know, like I said, while there'll be, you know, some, you know, hardline activists in some subgroups in the Arab community who will say, well, we're Republicans for Trump. Um, at the end of the day, people aren't going to vote for, for, for Donald Trump because of that. They'll vote for him because of the, the gut issues uh, in their communities, neighborhoods, and and uh, in the world that they want their, their kids to grow up in, the vision they have of the world they want their kids to grow up in. And I'll stop there. Uh, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to be a part of the panel. Thank, thank you, Jim. And, and thanks to all of our speakers. You all gave very thought-provoking comments. Uh, we have several questions. Uh, Jim, since you just spoke, I want to start with you. Um, uh, everyone understands and appreciates how historic and important this election is. But based upon the comments of several of the speakers today, is the Middle East really an important factor in this election overall, given all of the other issues that everyone has addressed and that many of us understand? No. No, it's not. And, and this may be one of the first elections in a long time where the performance of the... Pre I always used to say no candidate ever runs on the Middle East but their performance is ultimately judged on how they did on the Middle East. Uh, this is an election where that, that pales the, in terms of the life behavioral decisions. Jay said, I'm going to use that over and over again. Um, it, this, is election, this is an election about Donald Trump. It's about Donald Trump's behavior, Donald Trump's rhetoric, Donald Trump's... Um, Donald Trump. Um, Republicans will vote for him because they, they want to defend uh, his vision of white America that protects them from foreignness and threats to their culture as they see it. And Democrats are going to vote against him for the very same, the opposite reason. Um, the, the Middle East, it, even, even with uh, you know, the, the, the evangelical vote, um, it, you know, there's a, that's an ideological point about the rapture and Armageddon. But just like suicide, you know, Nobody actually wants to die, uh, even though we believe in heaven. Uh, it's not like, oh, good, I want to go to heaven, so let me go quickly. People believe in the rapture, but they're not actually like doing everything they can to get there, right? It's like 
they kind of hope that that's at the end of the uh, at the end of the road here. So people aren't going to vote for that. Um, they're not going to vote because he moved the embassy to Jerusalem. It just puts a punctuation point on the fact that yeah, he's on our side. Um, but it's not. This is not the motivator in in this election. Um, and uh, and so yeah, I, I just don't don't see uh, the Middle East playing the role that it 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 might have played in in, in earlier elections and did play. Uh, I, t I would agree with that. In fact, uh, yeah, it was a much bigger issue in prior elections, uh, particularly for Republican candidates. Uh, yeah. When we were, uh, but uh, interesting, it's a conclusion I've come to as well. Uh, Jason, turning to you, um, uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, is the Middle East really a serious issue for evangelicals? And uh, you, you mentioned the poll about uh, evangelicals and the view of Jews living in Israel. Has anyone polled whether evangelicals are in favor of Palestinians living in Israel uh, proper or within an independent state of Palestine? Is there an evangelical view on this? I'll um, start with the first question about the role of the Middle East in the election. I, I agree with Jim's point that um, these views of sort of end times is really more about just saying which side a person's on um, and signaling things. It's not driving people to the polls. It, it may have been more influential um, among some people and more salient after um, September 11th. And then th this seems like a silly reason. This is my guess. There was this like left behind book series that was wildly popular um, in the evangelical community. I think that made that issue salient to people. That's not really going on much um, in, in common parlance right now. I don't think so. Um, in terms of polling on evangelicals on um, views of, of Palestine, I'm not familiar with it on the top of my head. I would have to look that up. Um, those who wanted to do more research, the, the best resource for finding specific polls like that is um, the Roper Center's iPoll. Um, I think it's at the University of Connecticut now. They have a great archive of uh, polls that have been conducted. I'm, I'm sure there, there are several surveys that provide data on that, but I'm not familiar with it on the top of my head. Thank you. Uh, Dalia, we have uh, so, a few questions for you from the audience. Uh, the first is, uh, are there differences between Arab and non-Arab Muslims? when it comes to voting patterns uh, and the role of the Middle East uh, in the vote. Uh, and after you answer that, I've got a couple of more. Yeah. Thank you for that question. We don't find that there are these kinds of uh, systematic differences between Arab and non-Arab Muslim voters when it comes to the Middle East. The Middle East, at least in open-ended questions on what the most important issues are, just doesn't, is not mentioned um, spontaneously by by many in the Muslim community period, including Arabs. Um, the only things that I would say distinguish Arabs a little bit, and really there's very few differences between Arabs and non-Arabs, but one that does stand out is Arabs are, or have been for several years, more likely to report religious discrimination. So Islamophobia does, does tend to be racialized where Arabs are more likely than non-Arabs to experience discrimination that they interpret to be based on their religion. Thank you. Um, and two parallel questions. Um, uh, to what extent uh, uh, do American political party stances on Israel, Palestine play into Muslim American votes? Could there be any connection between low voter turnout in the Muslim American community and dissatisfaction with the stance taken by both Democrats and Republicans on these Israel-Palestine conflict? Well, I think that that's, you know, I was going to say, um, the first thing I was going to say is, is, is there much of a difference from the perspective of most people, at least until very recently, where some Democrats have started to speak more critically. But before that, there was very little difference between the two parties when it came to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, so I think that there there is something to the possibility that those 15% of, of Muslim voters who say that I don't I don't like the options, they're you know 
no one represents my perspective, that some of that does relate to both parties' stance on the Arab-Israeli or the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, though we have not actually heard that explicitly from respondents. Uh, and uh, Dalia, do you have any sense of whether there's a strong settlement sentiment among uh, Iranian Americans for Trump because he takes a hardline view of, on the Iranian regime, which most of them oppose? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to answer that just because um, our sample size isn't big enough to be able to break it down by, you know, a group like Iranian Americans. Um, so I. I won't, I won't, I don't have the, the research the to respond data. to that. I don't have the data. Okay. What was the question, George? Because uh, we do poll uh, The question is, is there a strong sentiment among Iranian Americans for Trump because he takes a hardline view against mm -hmm. the Iranian regime, which they... Well, uh, we're in the field, post. we're in the field right now doing a poll of Iranian Americans. Uh, I don't know, uh, but in previous years, we poll for PIA, um, an Iranian American organization. Uh, in previous years, we've seen the anti-Trump sentiment grow to really significant uh, levels um, and fear of the impact of a conflict on their families at home. They feel deeply about the, uh, the division um, uh, that, they, that they've experienced, that, they, that, that they're afraid sometimes to call uh, to Iran. They're more afraid of the impact here in America than on what the regime in Iran might be doing. They're not supportive of the regime at all. Um, and uh, they do want change in Iran, but they find the, pro the prospect of war and they're seeing the impact of sanctions on their family being really, uh, really significant and hurtful. So I'd say that uh, there's not much chance of Trump getting significant support from Iranian Americans. They don't feel that at all. And that, that again is Iranian Americans who are Muslim, Christian, and and uh, and Jewish? A significant number of Iranian Americans are Jewish, and interestingly enough, there's very little demographic difference in the in the the, the responses the differences in the responses among the different demographic groups. The only difference is sometimes the Iranians who came before the Shah left office and those who uh, after the the revolution, uh, those who came in in more recent years. But it's an interesting community. Um, back in fall of 2019, I was trying to plan our polls of North Carolina for for the, the calendar year 2020. And, and so we asked an open-ended question, what is the number one issue you'd like to hear politicians talk more about in the 2020 elections? Among North Carolina voters, um, we only found 3% said something related to national security, foreign policy, or the military. Um, similarly, Gallup has been asking their most important issue question for for years, um, and in 2020, most of the issues related to uh, foreign policy or uh, Middle Eastern world just are like an asterisk because they're they're too small of numbers to even report a, a a full integer. So I think those numbers point out that this this election is largely being driven by healthcare and the economy. In that same um, fall uh, poll that was really internal for our planning purposes, healthcare was the number one issue. Twenty percent of voters in North Carolina, this critical swing state, said health care. That varied a little bit by party. Health care was more important for Democrats in North Carolina than Republicans. 24 percent said health care among Democrats, 15 percent among Republicans. So it really was coming down to what people wanted to hear about pre-COVID was health care, economy, immigration. And then a lot of people were saying, I want to know about the political system. I want either politicians to get along some sort of anti-polarization statement or they were saying, we've got to do something about Trump specifically. If we did a poll today, um, would we find people, that was always an attitude, right? And Democrats thought you needed to run Trump by bringing people together because people were tired of division. I'm kind of wondering if that's changed, especially after Ruth Bader Ginsburg, there's this sense of it's, it's either all or, you know what I mean? I, yeah, I consider myself sort of a, a formerly raging moderate. Um, it's increasingly difficult to, to do that now, and trying to be a nonpartisan bolster is hard. And it, I think it's harder and harder to sort of advocate for um, let's try to find the common middle ground and get to a point where we can actually pass legislation uh, just because things are so divided. And it often becomes, by taking a position of sort of 
well, let's either be neutral or let's try to find some way we can all get along. That in itself is becoming an ideological position um, in opposition to social progress. I, I'm just going to ask Dadia a question. Um, this issue of polarization is is so intense, right, and so real. And Muslims find themselves in the crosshairs of this. Of this, uh, you you become a partisan issue. Going back to Newt Gingrich and the the uh, the Victory Mosque, and then 2012 mm -hmm. candidates saying they wouldn't uh, uh, nominate a, a Muslim unless he took a special loyalty oath, et cetera, et cetera, up to Donald Trump. How, how, right. How does it feel being in the crosshairs? <laughs> well, I think it probably explains why so many Muslims are voting Democratic, because uh, despite, you know, maybe some more conservative social values that might, where people might expect them to vote Republican, but I think there is so much alienation from some of this rhetoric that, um, that they find themselves only having almost like one choice. However, I always think it's, um, and I, I have a whole talk on Islamophobia and its impact. And, you know, I, I think that one of the hardest things about election season is it's when uh, Islamophobia really spikes. And, and it's a very calculated, deliberate process. So when you look at um, polling over the past 20 years since 9-11, and when anti-Muslim sentiment rises, it does not coincide with terrorist attacks. It coincides with election season mm -hmm. and the run-up to the Iraq War. And so it's um, yeah, it's got to be it's got to be hurtful. George, you're back. Um, I remember a poll that AEI did years ago where it shows that Arab Americans. Uh, uh, vote, uh, have a higher registration rate than just about any other ethnic political constituency and vote in a greater percentage. Mm -hmm. We heard earlier that there are about 5 million uh, uh, American Jewish voters. Do we have a sense of how many there are of the Arab American community and, and whether these statistics still obtain in terms of voter participation and registration? Yeah, Deborah actually said 7 million. I thought that was interesting. Uh, I've not heard that number before. Um, uh, Arab American, we say 3.7 million. We don't have an actual number, um, but we uh, of of those who are registered. But the percentage of those registered, back when we did it, and again we're doing another one. We haven't asked that question in in a number of years, but back when we asked it, it was um, uh, in the 80 percent range that were uh, that were registered to vote. Here's the problem that we will find is that. There have been, whether people realize it or not, there have been 500,000 Arab immigrants to come into the U.S. since 2000, uh, in the last 20 years. That is a huge number, a record number. Um, and it, it includes uh, a much more diverse population than we've ever, ever seen before. From Iraqi refugees, a lot of uh, Chaldeans, a lot of, uh, of we, we, we did have a huge influx of Shia from the south after uh, when Saddam started persecuting them. Now it's from a cross section of Iraqis. Um, a lot of Syrians have come. Um, a lot of Somalis have come. The North Africans continue to come as a part of the lottery system, came as a part of the lottery system. So here we are with this incredibly diverse community many of whom aren't yet citizen and aren't yet uh, registered. And so I don't know what the numbers or breakouts going to be when we, when we get there. And uh, we'll, we were hoping for the census, but it looks like the census is not going to be able be as helpful to us as we wanted it to be. We didn't get the MENA question that we wanted uh, that would have helped us do the identification. And uh, we're not sure what the count's going to look like in terms of with COVID making it more difficult. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I really don't know the, the answer to that, George, other than the fact that we've seen intensity and turnout um, in recent elections, very significant, a lot more Arab Americans running for office uh, on all levels, and, uh, and a lot more Arab Americans involved in the political process than ever before. I mean, I, I get on the phone with the, the state directors uh, for the Biden campaign in different states, and I'm like, oh, oh my God, that's a young Arab American woman who's, you know, involved in that state and, and a young Arab American guy in that state. I mean, 
they actually, this is something very different than we had 20 years ago. Uh, but, you know, I, I can't quantify it other than just anecdote. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, uh, a question for Jason. Has the Jerry Falwell problem reflected in any way on the evangelical behavior uh, toward opinion about Donald Trump? The Jerry Falwell Jr.? Um, yes. I, I don't think so. Um, there's been s such a long history of scandals among evangelical religious leaders doing things that are totally like opposite of what they're preaching. Um, and it doesn't seem that it has like we could we could go through a long list of evangelical preachers who have making bad life behavioral decisions. It, yes, that, that is one euphemism for it. Um, and then the coalition has rolled with that. So I don't know that this is going to be that different of one. Um, and I'm not sure how important Jerry Falwell Jr. was in terms of a unifying voice among evangelicals. He was certainly powerful within his um, university community, but he definitely was not this sort of national kind of leader like his father was or um, Billy Graham or someone like that. Thank or Pat you. Robertson. Or Pat Robertson, sure. Uh, Dahlia, a question for you. Uh, does what, To what extent do, does American political party stances on the Israel-Palestinian question play into American Muslim votes? Um, uh, could there be a question between low voter turnout in the Muslim American community and dissatisfaction with the stamps by both Democrats and Republicans in the Israel-Palestine conflict? Yeah, I, we already actually discussed that uh, a minute ago, but um, you know, like I said, the the two parties are very similar in their stance, uh, and um, and it might certainly have a role in um, the the group of people who are not interested in voting. Um, that they just don't see their their priorities or their um, perspectives reflected in any in either party. Thank I'm not you. I'm not finding that the case um, at all. Uh, I think there's a the I, the Biden campaign released a policy paper on uh, for Arab Americans that was really quite significant in terms of its and I was I was you know I was quite pleased with it. Look, could they have gone further? Absolutely. Do we want them to go further? Are we pushing them to go further? Absolutely. But um, is this the best statement we've ever gotten? Look, uh, you know you know the 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 um, it's really hard not to be better than Donald Trump um, on this issue. But uh, when when Joe Biden's policy paper says that he opposes uh, efforts to delegitimize Israel, including the boycott, divestment, sanctions, but then adds a comma and says, but we will protect the right, the constitutional right of every American to free speech, which is why Joe Biden spoke out in defense of the two congresswomen who wanted to trans tra travel to Israel and were denied entry. That's huge uh, for a presidential candidate to say, I opposed what Israel was doing in defending Rashida and Ilhan, and also saying, you have a constitutional right to do this. Uh, Israel has spent literally tens of millions to get states to oppose BDS and criminalize it. And here you have the Democratic Party nominee saying, uh, it's not only not criminal, but it's constitutionally protected free speech. So I, I think that there were differences here, and uh, and I think that um, we appreciate them. But at the end of the day, whether they were good or bad, and there is a difference, and I think there it's better. Um, it's not going to be the issue that's going to drive Arab Americans or anybody to the polls. Ultimately, what's going to drive them to the polls is their feeling that if the other guy wins, it's the end of the world. Um, and and that. And I think that's very real. Thank you. Uh, we have a, an interesting question. Um, one of the uh, viewers noticed that generally the panelists avoided the use of the word racism uh, as a main factor in being responsible for the way Americans will be voting one way or the other. Um, would anyone like to expand? Well, I'd like to first say that I didn't avoid it. I made it as one of the two top issues American Muslims considered. The one first being the economy and job creation, the second one being uh, 
issues around racism, Islamophobia, and civil liberties. So, um, and and the fact that uh, you know American Muslims are the most likely faith community to support the Black Lives Matter movement and express concern about police brutality. So, no, I I think that um, this is a major issue for Muslim Americans for for the fact that we are the most ethnically diverse where plurality of us identify as black but uh even non-black muslims are equally concerned about about these issues in many many cases look i i um george in, in an article i wrote recently and i did make mention of it in my comments i said for republicans victory is seen as necessary to save white america its culture values and way of life and the slogan, Make America Great Again, is understood not so much as a vision of the future, but as the last ditch effort to salvage the lost glory of a fictional past. For Democrats, victory is seen as essential to protect America from incivility, racial hatred, and a dangerous drift toward authoritarian rule. I think it is a fundamental question in this election. When I talk about Armageddon, about the end of the world on both sides. I mean, that's actually what is playing out in the minds of, of, of voters is, do we want continued race hatred? Do we want continued incivility? Do we want um, a, a, the, the kind of division and, and you know, call to violence from a, a budding authoritarian? Or uh, on the Republican side, it's, as Donald Trump said in Minnesota, how do you like your refugees? Um, and then started praising their, their great genes in Minnesota. I mean, what's that all about? If not an appeal, a direct appeal to race, people get it. People get it on both sides. There are some who say, that's great. You know, that's what we want. We want to keep, when he warns about the suburbs being uh, overtaken, if, if Joe Biden wins, it's the end of the suburbs, meaning poor people of color are going to be moving into federal housing projects a direct appeal to race. And I, I think that that's today, Middle East, uh, trade agreements and, you know, climate, all of those issues are there and they're real. But what's going to drive this vote is my fear that if the other guy wins, it's the end of the world as I know it. That's, that's, it's the, it's a gut election. I um, agree with the prior points and would also point out that uh, plenty of studies on sort of retrospective of vote choice in 2016 showed very compelling evidence that uh, racism drove vote in 2016. And something uh, talking about surveys of the evangelical community related to Islam in the Middle East, a question, Islam is a threat. People who agreed with that, 74% of those were Trump voters. Um, the state strongly agreed that Middle East refugees are a terror threat. Eighty-one percent of those are Trump voters. Only twelve percent were Clinton voters. That level of overt or racial resentment or racism is not is usually covered up when we're talking about other racial groups. Um, it, it, for some reason, um, a number of white evangelicals and white Americans broadly don't hide their racism when it comes to the Middle East um, and Arab Americans, and um, that's. It's terrible that the attitudes exist, and it, it's even more shocking that people are willing to be that open when a pollster calls them as a total stranger, and then they'll still admit these attitudes that um, yeah. maybe they don't recognize that it's overtly racist, but it still is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're, we're, we're approaching the end of our time. Um, I just wanted to ask all the panelists one last question, and that is basically um, Justice Ginsburg's untimely passing. Um, what do you think, what effect do you think that will have on the voting patterns of your con the constituency that you've discussed today, if any, and what effect do you think it might have on the results of the election? Um, Jason, why don't we start with you, the evangelical? I think the effect is, is probably modest, um, large part because most evangelicals were already, uh, pretty excited about this election and enthusiastic to go vote. Um, that said, I think there, I personally know lots of evangelicals that find Trump's behavior abhorrent, but they still say, well, I'm, I'm gonna go vote for him because I don't like democratic policies. Many of those folks may have said, I just can't deal with Trump anymore, so I'm just gonna stay home. Um, 
having the Supreme Court vacancy may remind them that the stakes are quite high on issues like abortion that they care deeply about and motivate them to turn out. So it may have a turnout effect. I don't think it's going to have a persuasion effect. Dahlia? Well, I, I agree with Jason on the fact that it will have possibly a turnout of, uh, effect on the American Muslim community. Um, we, what the, the way the Supreme Court looks is a huge uh, issue for American Muslims for a lot of reasons. And um, the loss of, you know, one of the, the justices that wrote the dissenting uh, opinion against the Muslim ban is quite significant. And so I, I think if, if anything, um, it just adds to the urgency of this election. Agreed with both. Thank you, uh, and thank you, uh, uh, all of you, for the the substance and the tenor of your remarks. They were were quite uh, thought provoking and uh, um, uh, very well very well presented. Um, uh, I would like to thank the around 100 participants uh, uh, in this uh, uh, first day of the ACW's fifth annual conference, and for all the questions we've covered all of them, uh, I believe. Um, uh, and uh, again, sincerest thanks to our panel for their uh, uh, insights. A video of today's event will be available on the ACW website, and I invite you to register to attend days two and three of the conference on September 25th and 30th. And additional questions can be found at ArabCenterVC.org. Thank you all very much um, for your participation today. Um, and uh, that concludes this panel. Khalil, do you want to say anything before we, we uh, wrap up? Appreciate the participants that joined us today uh, across the country and even some from uh, overseas. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in part two on the 25th. Thank you very much.